I'd like to ask you about supplements for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's an enormous landscape, but I believe there are a few things that you believe in, meaning they exist sure. and, and there are decent data to support their use. Maybe even some anecdotal data based on your own experience. As long as we highlight it as such, it could be interesting. I've heard you talk about two in particular, uh, one that I'm very familiar with, which is creatine monohydrate. If you could um, share your thoughts on that, not just for muscle building, but maybe any other purposes for it. Um, and then the other one is one that, um, frankly, I'm learning more about all the time now, thanks to your prompt, which is Rodolia rosea. Mm -hmm. I think I pronounced that correctly. And, um, and why that might be interesting or of use to people. Yeah, so touching on creatine, it is the most tested, safe, and effective sports supplement we have. I mean, it's just, there are thousands of studies on creatine monohydrate now. And I, I, would, I would say very clearly too, um, if you're using any other form of creatine, I think you're wasting your money. Um, creatine hydrochloride has some um, hype around it. It's, in, it's apparently it's a little more soluble. Um, the claim is that you need less, um, but there's only a couple studies on it and, and it's more expensive. And so creatine I, monohydrate is not particularly expensive. No, right? well, I realize people have different budgets, but yeah. it's not, it doesn't land in the, it, it, it's, it's not it's a gotten, budget breaker. Yeah. It's gotten more expensive because of COVID and supply chain issues. Even the, there's forms of creatine that appear to be as good like hydrochloride, but it's more expensive. And then things like creatine ethyl ester has been shown to be worse than creatine monohydrate. Uh, buffered creatine is as good or worse and it's much more expensive. So I tell people, just take creatine monohydrate. It is tried and true. It's been shown to saturate the muscle cells 100% with phosphocreatine, and that's what you want. So creatine uh, works through a few different methodologies. One, through increasing phosphocreatine content, which helps improve exercise performance. Um, it also appears to, improve in cover, it appears to improve recovery, and it increases lean mass, a lot of which is through bringing water into the muscle cells. But that is, I mean, muscle cells are mostly water. So when people say, well, it's just water, that's what muscle cells mostly are. Um, and uh, it also increases strength and some other metrics. Now, it also has been shown in studies that people tend to get a decrease in body fat percentage. Now, that's probably because they're getting an increase in lean mass, and so the relative is a decrease in body fat percentage. But there are a few studies that show a decrease in fat mass as well. I don't think that creatine is a fat burner. I think that people are able to train harder, build more lean tissue, and so that's probably having an effect on fat mass. Then they've actually shown more recently some cognitive benefits to creatine, which I find really interesting as well. But the only knock on creatine that anybody's been able to come up with, because they've, they've debunked the kidney stuff, they've debunked the liver stuff, they, it, there's no evidence that it harms healthy kidney, kidney or liver, uh, is hair loss. So what about hair loss? Because there was one study in 2009 that showed that creatine increased DHT. Um, but it, they didn't really show an effect on any other sex hormone. So it's kind of strange. Like you would think if there was an increase in DHT, there would be like something else that changes as well. Um, and it's only one study and again, didn't directly measure hair loss, measured DHT, which we know is involved in the loss of the follicle, the follicle. So what I would say is that I am not convinced it's only one study, never been replicated to my knowledge. And it was looking at a mechanism rather than an outcome. So, uh, if you, if you're somebody who's prone to hair loss and you want to avoid creatine because of that, I understand. But for most people, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's something to worry about. Do you em emphasize the classic loading of creatine, taking it a bunch of times per day and then backing off or just taking it consistently at the, I think five grams per day is kind of yeah. the typical um, dose that people take? So uh, again, no solutions, only trade-offs. Um, you can load it and you will saturate your phosphocreatine, phosphocreatine stores faster, like usually within a week. Uh, if you just take five grams per day, it'll take two, three, four weeks, uh, but you will get to the same place and you're probably going to have a much lower risk of GI issues. Some people, it, creatine can be a gut irritant. Um, if it is for some folks, I would recommend splitting it into multiple doses. So maybe like multiple two, one or two gram doses per day. And definitely don't load it if you're somebody who has GI issues from it. As far as uh, rhodiola rosea, the research is still in its infancy. I was just reading a, a new systematic review that kind of concluded that we need more high quality research. But 
The research that is out there seems to suggest that not only does it reduce physical fatigue, but it also reduces the perception of fatigue and may also enhance uh, memory and cognition as well. And it's referred to as an adaptogen. So I, I really like it. Um, my anecdotal experience is when I combine that with caffeine, it tends to kind of smooth out the effects of caffeine. It's a more pleasant experience. And there's also some evidence that if you're like coming off caffeine, that it can reduce the, uh, the negative side effects to caffeine withdrawal, which by the way, I, I didn't really believe in that until I actually did a cold turkey uh, so before a meet, I will cut out caffeine for seven days because you can basically reset your caffeine tolerance in seven days. And like two days in, I mean, I'm groggy. I've got the headaches. Usually I'll get like body aches that come up because caffeine is actually a mild analgesic. Um, and yeah, so it was very interesting to see, but I slept like a baby. I'll tell you that. I and slept then you like took baby. caffeine prior to, to your event. To, to the meet. Yeah. So you really want the maximum punch from it. Yeah. That's why you do that. Yeah. And like I said, uh, rhodiola tends to, it doesn't eliminate those, those negative effects, but they tend to, it tends to dampen them a little bit. So I really like it again, would like to see more research on it, but there's a lot more stuff coming out. Like, um, ashwagandha is another thing that looks pretty promising, uh, seems to increase testosterone modestly. Interesting. Um, I don't think it's an, like they've shown increases in lean mass. I don't think the increase in testosterone uh, explains the increase in lean mass. It's just not a big enough increase. Could it be the decrease in cortisol? People have talked about- it's possible. It does decrease uh, stress, stress hormones. It also has been shown to help with sleep. Um, but I would like to see more research looking at mechanistically how it's increasing lean mass before I kind of say conclusively that this is, a, you know, the next creatine. There's more research that needs to come out. And then there's some other things that, that have an effect. Um, you know, citrulline malate, there's, there was a new meta-analysis that showed that citrulline malate can reduce fatigue and uh, increase, uh, I think, time to fatigue. And it may actually have some small recovery benefits as well. Um, different forms of carnitine can actually have recovery benefits. And actually, interesting, um, I think it's carnitine tartrate actually has been shown, uh, Volek published a study that actually showed that it increased androgen receptor density in muscle cells. That's interesting. Now, L-carnitine and its other forms that are... Pretty, I think there's good evidence that they can improve um, sperm and egg health for people who are looking to conceive. Oh, interesting. Yeah, there are a um, surprising number of studies on this in, hum mm. in humans. Um, but yeah, androgen receptor density, and that, that's from oral L-carnitine. People are taking capsules, yes. not injecting right. directly yeah. into a muscle. Yeah. And then you've got things like, obviously, like the other most effective supplement out there is probably caffeine. I mean, like if you look at the research studies, caffeine produces very consistently improvements in performance. Um, so that's another one. Some people don't like the effect of caffeine. That's okay, but I wouldn't know because I've never come off it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, interestingly, they they do show that the effect appears to be consistent. That that even if you're a habitual caffeine user, you do still get a benefit every time you take it. But like you said, you're just used to it. You know. Um, so you know, there's those things. You, then you've got like things like uh, beta alanine, which for it's in our it's in our pre-workout probably not super helpful for um, most people for resistance training it does seem to have some uh, benefits for like high intensity like if you get out you know more than like 45 seconds or 60 seconds of like really hard training it does appear to help with delaying fatigue for that um, and then you've got things like uh, betaine or also called trimethylglycine which there's some evidence it can improve lean mass. Um, there's some evidence that it can um, improve power output. So there's a few things out there, but you know, most of the stuff is not very good. So, you know, I, I think that that's, you know, those kinds of supplements, you know, very useful. Uh, but again, I would never tell people they need supplements. Like again, even like something like creatine is gonna be a very small effect compared to like proper nutrition, recovery and hard training. You know, uh, one of the things I, I was, I was talking with Ben Bruno the other day and uh, I said, you know, like some people will ask me like, how does this person make progress? Because, you know, their programming is, you know, it's not evidence-based or, or you know, this guy, how's he like, he's, his exercises are dumb. And I, I'll say, yeah, but they train really hard for 20 years. Like, you know, one commonality you see between like really successful athletes or bodybuilders is 
they train really hard. And one of the things I have observed is the more into the weeds people tend to get, and again, this is just my own anecdote and observation, the more into the weeds they tend to get, the less hard I see them train. And so one of the things I really like that uh, Mike Israel said, who's got a PhD and is a bodybuilder himself, he said, you can't out science hard training. Mm -hmm that if you're looking to build muscle and you're looking to improve your body composition, that the main thing is just doing the work over time.